calm and rational, but impassioned thought. Uh, we are very fortunate to have with us today five speakers who exemplify that ideal and who, in line with the goals of the conference, bring together perspectives that are not one nation, but multiple nations and regions, not solely academic or solely commerce, but both and policy practitioners, and also to some degree interdisciplinary. And for that, I'm grateful to Marcus Brunemeyer, the Edward S. Sanford Professor of Economics at Princeton University, author of the new book, The Brazilian Society, and I'm proud to say a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. Chong N. Bai, who's Mansfield Freeman Chair Professor, Dean of the School of Economics and Management at Tsinghua University, China's leading university, and Director of its National Institute for Fiscal Studies. He was a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the People's Bank of China from 2015 to 2018. My old friend Karan Bacha, who is Vice President of Government Affairs and Public Policy at Google, he had previously was President of GE's Government Affairs and Policy Function. He's also served in key roles in the U.S. government, including at the Departments of Commerce and Transportation. His last role in public service directly was as Deputy U.S. Trade Representative. Followed by Martin Chorzempa, Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute. He's a former Fulbright Scholar and worked in China, including at Peking University's China Center for Economic Research and at CF40, our friends and think tank in Beijing. His forthcoming book, The Cashless Revolution, China's Reinvention of Money and the End of America's Dominance, Domination of Finance and Technology will be out early next year. Finally, to keep us all grounded in the real world because the commitment of the Next Step Conference is to think globally, and that means beyond simple economic solutions. We're very pleased to have with us Alina Noor, Alina is Director of Political Security Affairs and Deputy, Deputy Director at the Washington, D.C. Office of the Asia Society Policy Institute. She was Associate Professor at the Daniel Inouye Asia-Pacific Center for Security Studies and serves on the International Committee of the Red Cross's Global Advisory Board on Digital Threats. Today's event is on the record. We will be recording and promoting and making available to everyone who can uh, the videos of today's discussion. And we look forward to, after the statements of our panel, engaging in a group conversation. First, in the order of speech that I just outlined, let me turn it over to Marcus. Thanks a lot, Adam. It's a pleasure and an honor to be part of this uh, group and uh, talk about uh, big data, big tech, and the global economy. I will focus uh, very much on, on the big data aspects um, today and um, give a more an academic perspective. So if, if you look at the technological trends, the many technological trends we're experiencing in the last few decades and going forward, I would like to emphasize two besides, you know, smartphones and other things, but I think the two I would like to emphasize is the importance of digital platforms where we live in digital ecosystems and have a digital lifestyle, which was even more pronounced so during the COVID crisis. And the other aspect is the big data and the artificial intelligence, deep learning, leading to some recommender systems. Of course, the other aspects like smart contracts, value chains, and uh, internet of things and tokens, distributed ledger technology. But today I would like to focus on, on platforms and uh, the exploration of this data using artificial intelligence and deep learning. And there's, it's often said that data is the new oil and that's true and it's not true. In a sense, it's true that you know, it's a key strategic input for many production decision-making. But it's also not true because oil is, is a standard private good. It's excludable and rivalrous, uh, while information is non rivalrous So it's, it's different. So once I use the information, somebody else can use it uh, as well. So it's, it's slightly different than a standard good. And the emphasis I would like to make today is that there are different types of information. There's some hard information about a particular fact, but there's also a lot of statistical information, which is more about the correlation about things. So for example, I can have individual information about my own X-ray, about myself, but there might be some, the combination of pixels allowing identifying certain sicknesses like a cancer or whatever, uh, that uh, is some, if I combine a lot of millions of x-rays and get some information out of them, and that's statistical information, uh, which is, you know, 
it makes then the, the other information, the individual Excel more useful. But that for this, I have to have a lot of information, statistical information across many, many X-rays. And uh, that's useful information to have in order to make sense of that. And for this, I would like to go to a setting where I think we have now a, in the world where the insurance companies or platforms, they know actually more about ourselves than we know about our own selves. So you might wear some uh, uh, certain variable devices or other devices. You might not know what the implications are about your life expectancy or the probability of getting a heart attack. But if you combine it with data of millions of other citizens, then actually you might get a lot of information out of that. And typically when we study economics or any other uh, social scientists, we always are afraid of adverse selection that you do, you provide an insurance or you provide some, um, some lending uh, arrangements and there's, you get adverse selection, the wrong people take up, pick up, uh, the take up is the, by the wrong people, there's an adverse selection. And what I argue in a recent paper uh, with uh, Roit Lumber and Carlos Segura Rodriguez is there's now I would call inverse selection. So there is actually, the selection is actually changing from a different perspective. So it's not the informational advantage is actually not with the borrower or with the insurance client or whoever customer it is, is actually with the lender and with the insurance companies or the asset manager. So who, this entity will know more about the customer than he knows about himself. So the informational advantage, the information rent typically, which is associated with the customer is now given to this seller or the lender or the insurance company or the asset manager. And that leads to a radical shift from an adverse selection environment to an inverse selection environment because the big companies that can use big data and they can infer a lot of this uh, behavior and they can infer better what I know about that. And it's important what the information they can infer is the statistical information, how different uh, data points are connected and how one uh, information connects to another information. And traditionally, this was already the case. So for example, if you buy a red car, an identical red car compared to a blue car, you typically have to pay a high insurance premium for the red car because statistically it's the case that people who buy a red car, they drive more aggressively and are more exit prone. And even though it's an identical car, and you know, you as a customer, you might not know that, uh, but there is a, a very important distinction. There's a lot of this information uh, now we can infer from, statistically from a, across big data, which really flips the informational advantage. And this has implications in, in a sense that the price discrimination using certain algorithms will be explored a lot. So you can, firms can price discriminate way bigger, better than they could do beforehand and you know, flip the asymmetric information advantage. And it's also the case that the bigger the data set is, the better is the statistical information and the better the firms can price discriminate. The other thing is the average investor's information advantage uh, is you know, compared, for example, to asset managers. If you have a, a small investor, he has now an informational disadvantage to large asset managers because the large asset managers have all this big data that can get all the information out of that and run some artificial intelligence algorithm or some machine learning algorithm around it and get them a way better uh, asset allocation than a private investor could. And that undermines a little bit the underlying principle of the efficient market hypothesis, where you have a ton of people with individual private information and then they all act together on the marketplace. The price aggregates and all the information in the marketplace and reveals what the information is. And this will be now different. It will be that a few players who have access to the underlying data, they will have the information advantage and you know, the competitive nature of the efficient market hypothesis is undermined. The other thing is bigger is better. So that's big data uh, where you typically have, you know, run artificial intelligence, machine or deep learning algorithms, and there is economies of scope and economies of scale. So first of all, you would like to have uh, access to a broad recording stopped. Of, of recording data, in progress, uh, where you have unstructured data, textual data, social media data, payments data, and diversity is ideal. So ideally you would like to have it 
a gross, a huge uh, range of data and platforms provide you this data. And then you run essentially uh, the algorithms over that. On top of it, you would like to have more and more higher scale. You would like to have more and more of, uh, people and some, uh, there's no diminishing returns to scale anymore. It's actually the opposite. If you're larger, then you have a bigger data set, then you have a better recommender system because you, have, you can recommend to your customers better what's better for them. You have more customers, hence you're larger and that's a self-reinforcing role. So it's both economies of scope going in breadth for each individual person. You would like to collect more and more data across a huge range of aspects. And also you would like to have more and more people on your platform and they're increasing returns to scale and there's a size, so uh, a scale dimension on top of it. In terms of um, machine learning and other aspects, so there's a lot of uh, innovations so of machine learning and deep learning. What is surprising to me is that actually there's a, in academia at least, there's a little bit of backlash to machine learning and deep learning at the moment. It's going, you know, Bayesian approach. Of course, if you use machine learning and deep learning, you don't make any structural assumptions, very limited more technical assumptions, but the, there's no economic underlying assumptions going in. And that works really well if you know finally the truth and can expose to verify. So, you know, I run a machine learning algorithm over this picture and has to identify it's a cat and I expose that can verify it's a cat. But in many economic problems, you don't know exposed what the number and the estimator would be. And it's actually now there's a backlash and the Bayesian approach is coming back again, where you put the underlying economic structure and some prior structure to that. And actually it turns out in many applications, the Bayesian approach is dominating uh, the, the fashionable machine learning, deep learning neural network approach. Now, the second thing is we said already that uh, data is very important. The more scope and more scale you have, the better it is. And typically the way you get this data is through these platforms, because you can aggregate a diversity of activities in a closed ecosystem and you capture diverse data. And that changes the whole, if I go to the financial arena, it changes the importance of payments. So in the olden days, it was essentially that the bank was at the center place and it was lending and deposit taking. That was essentially very important between the customers, uh, A and B, for example, that the banks are in the middle and have an information advantage. Now it's really the platforms because the platforms see on top of it, they see all the payments, they see the e-commerce e activities, social networking and uh, media and so forth. And they can collect way more data than a single bank can do. And this way uh, they actually then provide some credit score, whatever it is to banking. And then the banks compete for customers with a certain credit score and so forth. So the pay payment platforms become essentials because their payment platforms have first access to the data. And that will lead to a fundamental challenge to the bank's business model. There will be unbundling of certain activities and there will be a bundling with activities on platforms. And that's essentially where then, you know, FinTech companies will came, come in and uh, play an important role. But all of that, you would, the, the data control in these big platforms will be the, the, uh, fine, the important element. So let me say a few words about, of course, the main topic is privacy, how to uh, control and regulate privacy and what is really privacy in the sense, you know, what privacy should one protect? And I thought a lot about, uh, you know, the underlying reason why we would like to have privacy in the first place. Of course, there's a privacy, we say, you know, if I protect the information of the customers, I protect the information rent or consumer rent or consumer surplus you want to call uh, for the, the customer, of course, if the customer knows more and can keep certain information on his own, he will give up that he might get a better recommender system if the supplier will have a better recommender system if the information is passed on. So it's still the information advantage. But there's a, a sense that you know you want to protect privacy not only for information rent or consumer surplus purposes, because you also would like to give uh, people privacy because that's where they can be really the authentic self. So whenever you do something and it's observed by outsiders, you might change your behavior. You're not really your authentic self. And that's really important to have some privacy if you do brainstorming. So for me, the key element for privacy goes in connection with brainstorming. If I don't have a private environment, I cannot freely speak and brainstorm with others. Uh, you know, what are the new ideas or what do you want to do and so forth. 
So having a space where you can actually freely brainstorm without being worried that others might uh, reveal it and badmouth me or cancel culture me or other things, that's actually the key in privacy. And that's essentially the freedom to brainstorm. And if we could take this privacy away, we will actually have less brainstorming and hence also fewer ideas, fewer innovations, because you can't really think outside of the box because brainstorming means you randomly throw ideas out and some of these ideas might be crazy and you would like to keep them private and not uh, be used to badmouth you uh, in a sense. So that's, I think, uh, one important element. So in terms of policy issues, and I know that, you know, there's a lot of emphasis of, on policy. So the key here is this inverse selection I would like to get across. That's the information power reversal. So where the, it inverses, the information advantage reverses from the customer to the supplier. Does this induce us in a rethinking of privacy regulation? Should actually the algorithms which allow the platforms and the big tech to extract all these correlations, should these algorithms be made public? Uh, then there might be an issue that if you make it public, then they don't have an incentive to invest in it. Should it be made public with a certain delay, like in a pattern arrangement? Uh, should the, the privacy rules be on, within certain digital borders? So should be there segmented markets in the US, there's China and Europe and each entity has its own privacy rules or do we want to have a more global arrangement? And this, what are the values across these different continents? And you know, how about this make it more or less attractive? And you know, there's shifts to these platforms. Should we promote the shift to the platforms because it leads to this data concentration or should we try to set some standards and make enforce interoperability across these platforms so that the data is seen more as a public good. So through open banking, where I can actually take my private data from one platform to another platform very easily, and it's not really locked in, in the platform. And all of this has to be done in such a way that the incentives for various companies to collect the data is still there and structured in a particular way, but also promote new entrants who can then use the data so not, not an incumbent is sitting on the data and you know, even though others would be much better in analyzing the data, they don't have X entry, they don't have a way to do that because they're blocked by an incumbent player. So let me leave it with this and let me conclude with this uh, final policy issues. And I'm happy and looking forward to discussion going forward. Thank you very much, Marcus. The policy issues, as you put it, it's good I didn't bother doing an introduction because you put, put it nicely. What we've got to bring people together are these questions of common challenges, privacy of who owns the information, the reversal of power in the information sphere that you spoke about, the ability to set standards, whether national borders are the right borders for these discussions of data and of standards, how the international sphere goes on. And I think underlying your, your very excellent analysis is the question of trust. Uh, we go back, there's a new article out in Foreign Affairs saying much the theme Danny Kwa and I had when we put together this panel, which is we had 10 years ago, 15 years ago, such hopes for big tech working together with governments, going across borders, raising standards. And now there seems to be widespread distrust both in big tech and in big government. And so the question is, can we help each other become more trusted for good reason, or do we have to have opposition between tech and government to build trust? So you've set us up beautifully. I know that Professor Bai has been wrestling with these issues in both a Chinese and a global context, particularly new issues of privacy and, and, and information efficiency. Professor Bai, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Adam. Uh, uh, I'm uh, really uh, glad to be uh, among this uh, panel. Uh, to discuss such an issue. And uh, um, actually, a uh, coincidence that uh, China's Personal Protection Act went to effect uh, November 1st. Um, in the US, it's still November 1st. Uh, in China, it's yesterday. So, so uh, after this, we have this uh, session. It's very uh, uh, timely. And uh, I would like to uh, talk about three uh, points. Uh, one is that uh, uh, big data and uh, information technology is, um, 
is transforming uh, economic uh, research and uh, uh, economic policy uh, analysis. And uh, many um, for good, but there's also risks. And uh, um, we, uh, we have fast, uh, faster access to better data uh, and a stronger ability to uh, analyze, analyze data when we do economic research, especially uh, when uh, we do it for policy purposes, because for policy research, uh, timely results are really uh, important. And uh, this uh, has uh, happened a lot uh, in uh, not only uh, in the advanced economies, but also in uh, economies like China. People use uh, uh, payment uh, information because uh, in China, about 86% of people uh, use electronic payment. So this uh, provides tremendous amount of uh, information. Uh, you can infer transaction records from these payment information. Also government tax risk, uh, information, um, because in China we have value added tax. So almost every transaction is taxed. Then you have information about these taxes. You have information about logistical flows and uh, you have information about the movement of people by tracking their phone, et cetera, et cetera. So the amount of information is huge and a lot of people have been utilizing such information to uh, make very timely uh, research and which inform policy uh, making. Uh, for example, during a pandemic, uh, some people use uh, the payment information and transaction information to analyze how uh, consumption credit helped uh, people uh, across different uh, uh, income uh, groups, um, which is uh, very uh, timely. Uh, however, um, so the benefits, I think everybody uh, can fully uh, uh, appreciate. However, there are also uh, risks. Some are quite common um, among all the countries. Uh, one potential risk is that, that we become over-reliant on such instant uh, analysis. Uh, then we forget about other uh, potential issues. Such uh, analysis using a large amount of data uh, is driven by the, 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 the situation where you know what you want to know. Uh, you, 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 you know what question you want to uh, answer. However, there are a lot of uh, unexpected, unintended consequences, which uh, may, may be missed by such analysis. When such analysis uh, overflows, um, then people may ignore other, uh, other uh, ways of analysis. Uh, for example, China now, uh, people didn't expect that, that this year the structure of the economy would change. So the, uh, the carbon emissions regulation didn't take into this uh, into account. So we have electricity supply disruptions everywhere. Uh, that's a huge, uh, impose a huge cost to, this, to the economy, uh, which was not, um, despite all these analysis, uh, no one uh, foresee. Uh, foresaw that and um, it, it was uh, missed. And uh, the, the, the fact that uh, the, such analysis, such uh, intensive use of data can generate benefit also suggests that uh, if the user of the data um, have other uh, purposes, it could also be used as a weapon. Uh, so that becomes an issue about cross-border data flows. And if you are afraid of the effect of sanction, you don't want uh, your adversary to uh, devise a very targeted, very effective sanction. So you, 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 you don't want uh, other people to know, uh, to get access to the data to make that possible. So just an example where uh, such uh, uh, use of uh, data and such use of very fast analysis can be uh, used from the perspective of uh, some uh, countries. So this is uh, uh, the first thing I would like to say. The second thing is about data flow across national borders. Uh, this is related to the issue I just mentioned about the uh, use of data as a weapon. Um, it, it, Adam suggested some uh, questions to me. Uh, one of them is, should there be common principles? Yes, uh, I think uh, uh, there should be uh, some common principles. 
even if it's difficult to reach agreement on these common principles, talking about them will be really uh, helpful. Uh, some of them are, uh, I, I think, uh, are universal, universally received. For example, protection of pri uh, in, uh, personal privacy, uh, data security, and uh, uh, national security, security and economic security. And I think these principles are all agreed upon. Then the question is um, the detailed uh, implication of of uh, of this. Um, earlier, I mentioned the abusive use of data from the perspective of certain countries. Also, there's uh, disinformation uh, issues. Disinformation can also be used as a weapon when uh, countries get into conflicts. So uh, some kind of regulation, some kind of control of data flow uh, would be uh, in, in unavoidable. Uh, so in, uh, in the case of China, China uh, requires local computing facilities, requires uh, sometimes uh, it uh, ask uh, uh, providers of data service to uh, hand out their source code, source code um, just to, to be able to make sure that uh, there are no backdoors there, et cetera. So these measures are not universally agreed upon. And uh, there are also other issues with uh, other countries uh, that uh, 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 insist on uh, that's not agreed by, by China. For example, the US uh, insists that uh, the data provide the platform, uh, data providing platform uh, are not reliable for whatever uh, information that's, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, flowing in the platform. Um, if you know people worry about this information, the effect of this information. So uh, I think there, there uh, not only China uh, is not comfortable with that. I, I think other countries may not be comfortable with that either. Uh, however, um, even if there are disagreements, uh, there uh, it's worthwhile to talk. But how, uh, before the agreements are made, uh, are reached, and uh, I, I think it's almost unavoidable to have um, multiple players, uh, tech players in the world. Um, there are big tech players in China, there are big tech players in, in the US, and uh, is it necessary for them to be separated by country? Um, well, if uh, there are no agreement on the general principles, if there is uh, much lack of trust, then um, especially when you don't know how, uh, what kind of technology is used by a foreign firm, you don't know the source code, you, uh, their computing facility is not located in your borders, then you, 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 you start to worry. So uh, in order to, uh, to reduce the barrier of information flow, uh, allow big players to to serve the whole world instead of uh, a few countries, um, some uh, compromises uh, has to be uh, have to be made. Uh, that's uh, that's the second point I would like to uh, to make. Uh, there, uh, uh, actually, about information cross border information flow. China, uh, the three days ago on October 29th, uh, China is uh, started a public consultation on the procedure for evaluating security concerns related to cross-border data flow. So uh, I, I think uh, the, the Chinese government realizes that uh, it is very important for uh, data to be flowing uh, across borders, but how to regulate it, especially about the security issues. Uh, the, the government is uh, making an effort. Of course, uh, it's, uh, we just, uh, the government just started the consultation process. We don't know uh, what the final result uh, will be. Uh, finally, about the regulation of big tech companies, uh, which um, uh, in, in, in the uh, last year, uh, it caused a lot of uh, concerns. And here, uh, especially about fintech companies, I think they are making tremendous contributions to the society. They make payment much easier. Uh, they also help uh, guarantee transactions and they uh, offer a better risk assessment when banks uh, make loans. Uh, they also uh, make their small loans, and uh, they also facilitate some 
policy uh, implementation, uh, such as uh, trans uh, cons consumption credits, etc. Uh, however, there are also uh, issues. Uh, these issues are uh, probably uh, common to every country. Um, some of these big tech companies engaging regulatory uh, arbitrage uh, or regulatory evasion. Uh, they violate some regulations, and they, uh, as a plat data platform, it's natural they gain monopoly position. Then the question is whether they use that position for unfair competition. There are cases where people are not happy with what, what they do. I, for example, uh, the price discrimination and forcing uh, users of uh, the platform to choose uh, their this platform with uh, and cannot use other platforms, etc. And uh, it also has the risk of uh, hindering innovation because uh, they are uh, they are too big. Uh, small innovators uh, cannot compete with them. There are concerns of uh, systematic uh, risk because they offer many different financial products which are not well regulated and uh, also data security. So all, there are all these concerns. And uh, uh, I think the regulators uh, still, uh, it, the, the, some of these concerns are very new to the regulators. So the regulators are also learning how to uh, improve the regulation so that innovation can still be encouraged at the same time, all these other concerns can be addressed. So uh, that, that's, uh, I, th that's my uh, comments. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Shangen. I mean, you, you've returned us to a critical theme on this topic of governance in an era of big data and big tech, but also of the Next Step Conference and our restoring the global economy more generally. That there are common problems that all societies are facing, that the compromise is going to have to be part of dealing with those problems and that the hard part is working out at what points is it optimal or desirable to have separate ways and at what points is it desirable to bring us together. Obviously right. with COP26 going on there's a whole other set of issues for which this applies but I think this is a great frame to bring to the issues of technology. Let me now turn to Karan Bacho of Google. Karan is not only, as I mentioned in the opening, a, a representative at one of the defining uh, tech companies of our time and therefore of our era. He's also someone who's worked extensively at a senior level in the US government, dealing with issues of corporate government interface. So very glad to have you with us tonight, Karan. Adam, thanks so much, and uh, thanks to both the Peterson Institute and the and the Lee Kuan Yew School. It's an honor to to join this uh, this panel. Um, uh, I'm I am not an economist. Uh, I will uh, confess that right up front. Uh, so I thought I would offer a bit more of a a policy um, perspective and and the perspective of someone who is working at a company that's. Um, that's confronted with these issues, particularly the policy issues on a on a day to day basis. Um, and Adam, maybe to go back to the to the comment that you made previously, which is that somehow we seem to have evolved from a world where there was great optimism that uh, you know technology uh, it, it would be something that brings the private sector and the public sector together to confront the great challenges of our time, and we somehow seem to have uh, have lost that that collaborative spirit, and is it possible to get it back? I think um, I say this from the perspective of a company whose mission is very much uh, aligned with with the idea of technology advancing the human condition. The the Google mission, uh, for those of you who have not uh, studied it, is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Uh, that's the mission that we've had since our inception about 25 years ago. It's the mission that continues today, notwithstanding the many, uh, you know, the, the, the company's evolution and the evolution in the external environment. Um, and at the core of that mission, I think, is very much a global vision of um, the role that uh, companies like, like Google, but also that technology can play in really driving 
um, uh, better governance, in driving an advancement in the human condition. Um, we, we don't see that today. And indeed, one could argue that we haven't seen it for you know, the past decade or more, um, which does raise sort of the question of, of why and, and is it possible to put the, the um, apple cart back together again? We think it is, um, but, but um, that it's going to require a pretty strong commitment and focus um, uh, between governments and between governments and the private sector as a community. So maybe just if I could offer a few thoughts here. Um, let me start with one of the questions that we often get, which is, um, what is it that government doesn't really understand about uh, tech or, or big tech? And, and I think one of the things that I'd flag in this regard is that the days where we could think of tech as sort of a unique sector unto itself isn't really what we see anymore. Uh, what we see is technology really as being an enabler of growth across all sectors. Um, you know, at one of the one end of the spectrum, we see tech enabling efficiency and innovation in large companies and in in traditional industries. Um, the discussion around AI rings particularly resonant on this. Uh, you know, at, at Google, for instance, we've invested for years in in deep computer science around artificial intelligence, and those innovations have enabled breakthroughs in our in our own products, such as you know natural language understanding in Google Search, let's say. But that same AI is also being made available to companies across uh, the, the the industrial spectrum to increase efficiency, for instance, of trucking routes, uh, and by the way, reduce carbon footprint as well, since we're uh, in the middle of COP26, um, or to enable financial institutions to prevent fraud, or uh, manufacturing firms to, to optimize supply chain logistics. Um, so, so this idea that big tech is somehow a, a world into itself that's not deeply integrated into many under other industries, I, I think is belied by the facts. And then at the other end of the, of the sort of size spectrum, we see more and more, particularly coming out of the COVID pandemic, tech enabling growth and, and opportunities for small businesses. Um, you know, through, through search ads, you know, we've got small businesses that heretofore never thought about uh, really operating outside of their local, perhaps neighborhood, maybe, maybe town, now growing national or internationally. Um, and again, COVID, I think, has been a driver of that and, and potentially something that can be built on uh, for the benefit of, of, of those kinds of businesses uh, uh, writ large. We've also seen, frankly, small businesses becoming more and more sophisticated in their use of digital tools to analyze demand or communicate with customers or, or provide, you know, a whole variety of goods and services to their, uh, to their, to their uh, uh, client bases around the world. Um, and, and most importantly, I should mention, this really has enabled them to be, to be more resilient uh, in this time. You know, some of the studies we've done suggest that you know, one in three U.S. small business owners uh, say that without digital tools over the last 12 months, they would have had to, to close uh, at least uh, large chunks of their business. So, look, we see this digital transformation, whether at the, at, the, at the large end of the spectrum or the small end of the spectrum, still in their emerging stages in a lot of markets, uh, you know, far from complete, even in developed economies, Almost half of the households in the developing world, for instance, lack broadband access, and a lot of traditional sectors, I think, are in the early phases of their of their digital technology utilization. Um, and and again, just even in the United States, we've got huge gaps, for instance, with significant parts of our workforce, uh, underrepresented groups in the in the Black and Latinx communities, for instance, at the you know not as, as nearly as far advanced as we would like to see in terms of. Uh, of, of capturing the digital skills that will enable them to succeed. So the question, I think, from our vantage point, as we look forward to how do we build that alliance between government and industry for the next 25 years is, is sort of this question of, of what set of frameworks, what sort of approach should governments take towards policymaking that will enable that in partnership with private industry? Um, we have we we get this question actually quite frequently, particularly from policymakers in the emerging markets who come to us and say, "Okay, Google, let us understand. We want to be 
uh, a digital champion? How can we get there? And to that end, we put out a, a, a study a few years ago, a couple years ago now, uh, called our Digital Sprinters Framework, which puts forward a set of ideas and recommendations from what we have seen work around the world of places, of, way, of, of, of ways to think about policy, to divide it up, um, that we think with the right approach and, and a collaborative approach with the private sector can yield those kinds of outcomes. Happy to talk about it in greater depth in the Q&A, but just very quickly, it gets to four, four areas, physical capital, investing in the infrastructure to enable connectivity. Um, secondly, human capital, uh, the, the necessity of investing in building the digital skill set uh, that will allow a country's people to be able to execute on a digital first agenda. By the way, this is a space where really there is opportunity for public-private partnership. Just to take a, a little bit of an example, you know, Google has been working intensely. We've trained more than 70 million people around the world and have particularly focused on regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, where we are with our Digital Skills Africa program. We've trained uh, more than 5 million people. 60% of whom report a positive impact on their jobs and career growth and, and business growth. Um, we're building up an IT certificate program. Anyway, we can go into greater detail about all that if of interest, but the bottom line is a, a skilling program, I think is an absolutely core component. The third is the government's own approach to technology, how it thinks about deploying it, whether it's in e-government services, whether it's in how they enable the innovative use of data, data data sharing initiatives uh you know to, to mark has touched on some of these kinds of concepts uh data interoperability we think is a is a is an important component to this so so anyway the the third would be the approach to technology and then the last obviously is you know having a regulatory uh enabling environment that promotes competitiveness that um that uh, allows for um, innovation to occur and for uh, whether large or small company innovation to continue to, to grow. Here you're talking about everything from tax regimes, but also a digital trade framework that promotes open markets and the free flow of data and interoperable regulatory standards. And maybe that's the point on which that I'd sort of close this and take it back to your original question, which is policies that um, have resulted in the balkanization of the internet. And we are seeing more and more of this. Policies that lead in that direction, I think are going to inherently uh, be in attention with the vision of the internet on which companies like Google was founded and which have yielded enormous benefits uh, to people around the world. The, the weaknesses that exist in international norms and international institutions increasingly around the operation of the internet, I think are have laid the groundwork for this, this trend that you've seen of fundamentally distrust. If we can get back over that, if we can, if we can figure out ways to align policies between governments and across borders, even if it is dramatically more regulatory outcomes, I think you are going to yield, see greater collaboration between public and private sector. So I'll stop there um, and look forward to getting into a further discussion. Thank you, Karan. It was not a bug, but a feature to have you talking about the practical side and not the economic side. This isn't just about economics. Um, we start there, but we go beyond it. Um, and in particular, your closing call for some amount of coordination, even if more regulation. I, I think in an international context is not that shocking, but for some of our American listeners, may be somewhat surprising. And so it's, it's good to hear that kind of issue coming from your point of view. Let me now turn to my colleague, Martin Trezempa, who, as I mentioned, has a bestseller in waiting coming out next year, but has been We've called upon him over the last few months to try to give some perspective on things that Professor Bai already spoke about, the transformations going on in China and how to compare those to issues being addressed in other countries, including but not limited to the US. So Martin, maybe you can give us your perspective. Sure, thank you, Adam. And uh, it's quite interesting to be presenting on this topic right after uh, Quran because uh, Google recently decided not to issue 
checking accounts and really enter in a new way into finance. And I'll be going into some of the reasons why there are some differences in what's happened in uh, the US, uh, China and elsewhere. So I wanna start by making, uh, I'm gonna focus on big tech and finance. And I really wanna start with by making the point that the way that policymakers are talking about the issues of big tech platforms and their role in the economy is incredibly similar across jurisdictions. Here I have four quotes. Uh, some are from the EU Commission. One is from Margareta Vestager, another is from a Biden administration executive order, and the other is from the head of China's central bank. And I think Karan may be the only person who would actually be able to identify which one came from which authority because they're just so similar. They talk about winner take all dynamics. They talk about cross subsidization, the impact on privacy and data. Everybody's using really a common language here, which shows that, that there's a lot of commonality. Here are the answers, but I think the point is, is uh, pretty clear which, uh, that, that there's just so much commonality. Uh, one area where there's limited commonality is the extent to which big tech has entered finance, as I alluded to earlier. It's extremely unevenly distributed. Uh, my favorite illustration of this is the chart on the right from the Bank for An International Settlements. When you look at it at the beginning, you start to think, well, United States, India, and China have very similar levels of uh, big tech mobile payments in their jurisdictions. And then you realize quick, quite quickly that actually China's is so much larger that it has to be on a completely separate axis to fit on the same graph. Otherwise, everything else would appear to be virtually zero. That makes China a huge outlier. I actually would say a vanguard in big tech's importance for the financial system, where the duopoly of uh, Ali and Tencent controls mobile payments in the trillions and lends trillions of, uh, of renminbi, even despite the, uh, the recent regulatory crackdown. Elsewhere, we see that the fit, financial footprint of big tech companies is smaller, both in the depth, so the scale of payments, for example, but also in breadth, that the Chinese big tech platforms provide a much wider variety of financial services than American big tech platforms, which so far have pretty much only focused on payments. But I, so, so you could sum this up by saying that it so far seems to be mostly a, a China issue, but I think there's gonna be a second round of, of FinTech revolution that's gonna have more profound international implications. And that was really exemplified by the Facebook Libra proposal, which would have taken the kind of transformation that WeChat wrought in China and brought it to be immediately a global network uh, across you know, billions of users around the world. And there we have, uh, we have, well, if that kind of revolution advances, we're gonna have more of these common concerns. I'm gonna go into three areas of, uh, of common concern in this area. One is uh, financial stability and regulatory arbitrage. There's a sense, and, and many of these are lessons I've taken from my work on China, that the rapid scaling possible for these uh, platforms that already have huge networks of existing users makes it difficult for regulators to keep up. Secondly, the political influence of the heads of these big tech companies can make it difficult to regulate. And that's one of the reasons I think that there's been such a pushback on Jack Ma after his speech uh, last year, a sense that he was maybe blocking regulations that would have been useful for, for financial stability. Uh, the complexity of the business models here and the interconnection between commer commercial and financial sides and all the data make it very difficult to regulate these companies and China's struggling with this as well. And then finally, conflicts of interest. You might have these platforms issuing a lot of loans so that they can sell more, uh, more on their e-commerce platforms, but then all the risk of this lending is being offloaded to the financial system. That's something we want to be concerned about. Another is in uh, competition over the long term. It might be impossible for financial firms alone, as Marcus alluded to earlier, to match the bundling of services that a big tech firm enters that straddles finance and, uh, and technology can do. And if there's cross subsidization where outside profits in one area, like, uh, like social networking, uh, creates, creates huge profits, that can then cross subsidize other markets, offer pro products below marginal cost and create distortions. And then finally in privacy, I think there are more privacy concerns if we combine financial and non-financial data in one platform as it's happened in China compared to a more fragmented way of doing it in the United States where it's in different places. And, uh, but here there's a really important trade-off where the more we try to protect privacy, often we have difficulty with competition as we've seen with uh, Apple's ability to, uh, to, to move in this direction. Uh, one important difference here uh, in, in what makes it a little less common is which country is, is the firm. I think that China would not have allowed the big tech firms to become so large in financial services uh, if they had been foreign firms. 
And that's something. And for the United States, one of the interesting thing is that they hasn't allowed big tech really to take a, such a large role in financial services, even though they are American firms. But they have been able to take uh, some of this role in India. So it's a, quite a complex and variegated landscape. Um, you might look at this list of concerns and, and, and come up with a negative view, but I actually take a quite positive view of the potential of big tech firms in finance looking at China. Uh, the, uh, if the advanced economies and emerging markets decide not to allow big tech firms into finance, they're going to forgo a lot of potential gains of benefit of, at least in the short term, increased competition. So this chart on the right shows just an indication of how stubbornly high the cost of remittances has been. That's something that Facebook's Libra project was supposed to uh, improve, but that was mainly blocked. There was a negative reaction, but we haven't really seen the kind of positive uh, discussions yet at the level that uh, that I would like to prepare really solid regulation for these firms to become uh, international. For example, the uh, the Financial Stability Board uh, created a stablecoin report a year after Libra, but only really addressed the financial side, didn't address these other concerns. There's a lot more work to do on the international side. Unlimited flexibility in the U.S. means we still have uh, quite expensive and slow payments, and it could have been much better if, uh, if big tech firms had been able to come in. Uh, secondly, in, in China, we're seeing, as uh, Professor Bai mentioned, a bit of a reversal from the relatively permissive regulatory environment that had existed until then. Uh, I actually somewhat agree with at least one of the things that Jack Ma said in his now infamous speech last year, that to make risk-free innovation is to stifle innovation. You need at least some. I, I would tend to agree with many of the regulatory measures that the Chinese authorities have taken thus far, uh, but uh, note the risk of tilting the playing field back to inefficient incumbents, which the banks have proven to be, and would note that, uh, that big tech entering finance has been completely revolutionary for China's financial system and brought a lot more competition, even if it hasn't worked out exactly the way that, uh, that the PBOC would have liked. So I want to conclude with two priorities for fintech cooperation moving forward. Some of these are going to echo what previous speakers have said. The first is to learn from pioneering jurisdictions to develop rules that are texted, tested ex ante in other jurisdictions before they're tried uh, in, in another one. So one interesting example here is that China was able to learn from GDPR, the EU's digital uh, data protection regime, when it was developing its own and was able to, in its view, improve on it in some areas being more flexible and others maybe being a little bit stricter, like in, in consent. Uh, in a similar way, others can learn from China on fintech regulations where the authorities there have had to address these concerns much more er much earlier than the rest of us, but then can also learn from international experience regulating uh, complex financial conglomerates, for example, from the Federal Reserve. And uh, these successes and failures that China's had can reduce the risk for others that can come up with an ex ante sensible regulatory framework for allowing big tech into finance uh, and then uh, rather than doing what China did, which is pioneering, taking this risk, or just simply what we've mostly done so far, banning it and then not allowing the potential benefits. And then second, uh, something that's been talked about is interoperable data protection regimes would really help make the rules of the road clearer for international role of big tech firms in, in finance. So the, e the fact that, there are, that the EUS EU privacy shield is currently in legal limbo creates huge uncertainty and difficulty. And I think in the absence of planned interoperability between these regimes, despite the potential uh, incompatibilities, we're going to have a balkanization and increased data localization requirements that ultimately benefit, uh, benefit nobody. Uh, so with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And again, the, the fintech is, of course, important on its own, but also important as an example of the more general issues we're all facing. And I think it's interesting to pull together some of the, Karan began with, the, with some ideas about the, the misconception that tech is a separate thing unto itself and you're sort of coming up the same issue from the other end. Um, Marcus uh, was dealing with the sort of underlying information asymmetries that beset all of this uh, for good and for bad. And Chang Eng, of course, gave us a sense of the actual policy development process. But this takes place in an international context, uh, a geopolitical context, a context of national identities and national security issues. 
And without in any way pigeonholing her, we're grateful to have an expert on those topics as well, Alina Noor with us. Alina, if you could please give us your take on how in this international context, we should be thinking about government and big data. Thank you, Adam. Um, and thank you, Peterson Institute and the LKY School for including me in this conversation. I may very well be the wild card in this panel, so I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, I have three points to offer for consideration. First, let me suggest that the political and power centers of both the East and the West Coasts of um, the United States i.e. Washington and Silicon Valley, are keenly aware of the role of data and tech in national security. What is unclear, though, is how much they each agree or disagree uh, with the other, and whether big data and big tech either advance or undermine national security. So on the one hand, you see stern congressional hearings playing out for hours over days with elected representatives dressing down the likes of Mark Zuckerberg, and accusing big tech of monopolistic behavior, which in turn undermines competition and innovation and ultimately economic and national security. On the other hand, you see increasing collaboration between the US military and intelligence agencies with big tech, or with the aim of capitalizing on commercial talent and expertise to preserve US primacy in the security domain. The US National Security Commission on AI, for example, was co-chaired by Eric Schmidt and um, had an overwhelming number of commissioners representing big tech, if you will. We're used to hearing the term military industrial complex. Now we have military technology or military digital complex. Uh, and I say this all without really any value judgment because it creates different dilemmas, including moral questions, uh, like if big tech and, and big data are supposed to be, if, if they're supposed to be a force for good, then they shouldn't be complicit in the business of war or in the business of unfettered surveillance or in the business of other unethical security practices. So consequently, US tech companies have come under fire from their own employees for involvement in national security projects, from civil society, and even from US national security stalwarts who object to these tech companies being present in and contributing to the Chinese tech ecosystem. So it's a difficult place to be in for these tech companies. Uh, Jeff Bezos famously or maybe infamously said if big tech companies are going to turn their back on the US Department of Defense, this country, the US, is going to be in trouble. But it's worth recalling that a lot of big tech and, and big data trace their origins and owe their growth to the US defense and security establishment. GPS, which we all use, is one such example. So it's a symbiotic relationship, not necessarily an easy or happy one all the time. My second point, is this, um, I'd like to widen the aperture a little by going beyond the United States to suggest that apart from China, maybe India in a few years, few other countries in Asia, particularly in Southeast Asia, my home region, have the capacity or capability to be involved in this tech security nexus at such an involved level. Sure, Southeast Asia is home to a few unicorns, maybe even decacorns, but the region is largely a mass consumer at scale of technology, and particularly those adopted and adapted for national security purposes. The question that then arises for countries such as those in Southeast Asia, and indeed much of the global South, is where are those data sets that are feeding the algorithms that are powering the technologies used for national security purposes coming from? How are they being collected? Where are they being stored? What other purposes might be they used for? And, and where, particularly if those technologies are being imported from elsewhere. So in a sense, it's really heartening that companies like Google are leading digital upskilling and capacity building in the global South. Maybe Google South, <laughs> um, bad pun, sorry. But right now it is the English speaking tech bros of Silicon Valley that code much of the digital world and dominate its architecture. 
There are concerns that big data, especially when used for national security purposes, will not only entrench the specter of big brother by big government, but will also lay the basis for a new kind of exploitation or colonialism as a charge uh, in much of the global South that depends on technology from the global North. Which brings me to my third and final point, um, that of demographics and power. By the turn of the century, 90% of the people on the planet are expected to live outside Europe and North America, with most living in Africa and Asia. And as Danny Kua usually says, 80% of the world lives outside the US and China. Now, if one of the promises of big tech, big data is to enrich the lives of those beyond the developed world or beyond the lives of those who live in the major powers, then those beneficiaries should have representation in determining how data and tech will change their lives. It also seems reasonable to expect that governance structures of data and tech should reflect the standpoints, the expectations, the value systems, the philosophies that may be unique to those regions. I think the current threats of tech decoupling between the US and China, should they come true, provide an impetus right now for the rest of the world to reflect on the governance trajectory of tech, perhaps even reimagine tech in the traditions of the 90%. There are scholars, for example, who are proposing the application of the concept of the African concept of Ubuntu to offer a more egalitarian, and equitable and democratic system, ecosystem in artificial intelligence. The Ubuntu philosophy of a person being more than a rational being, but a relational being whose personhood or humanity derives from its relationship with other persons offers an alternative philosophical underpinning to interpret data. And I've heard as well that wouldn't it be so great uh, if people in Indonesia or other parts of Southeast Asia or the rest of the global South could also contribute their cultural philosophies to how data is interpreted and ultimately applied to in their daily lives. So let me stop here. I look forward to the discussion that follows. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alina. It's important to call out the political underpinnings and omissions that beset not only our own, but many discussions. Um, thanks to our audience for bearing with us, I think it's been a fascinating discussion. I'm going to pose some questions to the group. We are welcome to welcome registered uh, guests to use the Q&A function on Zoom to submit questions either to specific members of the panel or in general. But let me go back and, and particularly go back to chung -An and Marcus. Um, what, what I'm really interested in is going back to sort of the final point, the final sub point of Marcus's last slide, which is this question of how does one incentivize continued innovation and, and progress on information uses without uh, over indulging the platforms or overindulging the incumbents. And I'm sure every member has view on this, but in particular, I think going back to our, our two academics to start. Um, I also, we've heard, and we heard this this morning in the discussion between Singapore's Senior Minister Tharman and US Commerce Secretary Raimondo, there, there is this competing notions of non-rival versus rival ideas of information. I mean, so it, it's all well and good to say that my use of information doesn't preclude your use of information. But if I go to my friends at Google or my friends at Facebook and I say, hey, can I have a bunch of your data to do research? Um, they generally say no for understandable commercial reasons. So can you, can you go a little bit more about how, <laughs> how you see the data? Is it the processing that provides the value added? Is it the amassing? I'm sorry if I'm being a little too simple-minded here, but people seem to act like there's a lot of ownership issue in, in data uh, in a way that, that the way you described it didn't seem to capture. 
So maybe Marcus and Chung end, please. Thanks a lot, Adam. Marcus, Good point. Yes. Please. Go ahead, Marcus, and then Chung. Okay. So let me just a uh, few words about uh, uh, both points you raised, uh, essentially. They're both extremely uh, well taken. Um, so, of course, the platforms, what you could see is that the platforms would like to set the standards and have low fixed cost for people entering on the platform. And then there's a lot of competition for people and companies being on the platform, providing data uh, for the platform. And that's essentially, uh, there's essentially competition on the platform and competition across platforms. And the competition across platforms it's very important to have the interoperability and have also some competition across them. And there's a tension there, as you pointed out, between on the one hand, you would like to have a standard, a fixed standard, so there's more clear competition on the one hand, but this might stifle innovation to some extent if you make the standards very rigid. And of course, they will, it will promote uh, competition because everybody knows what the standard is and how to compete given these standards but then it might make it harder to modify the standards going forward. And as uh, Elena, Elena pointed out, you know, then the question is who is setting these standards? Is it just China and US or are there other, uh, other countries involved as well? And that's where these things come into play. Overall, I would agree that, you know, the, the platforms have reduced the fixed cost. Once you want to start a business, it's way easier these days to start a business because you can get a lot of the services from the standardized platforms. So there's way more competition, way more entry for standard small, medium and medium sized enterprises to start a business and there's more competition, but there's less competition across the platforms. I think that's um, a very important uh, point uh, pointed out. Um, then the second point, uh, Adam, you raised is, is about the ravelness. So I agree with you, it's not so black and white. It's a little bit more subtle because indeed it's the case that you can exploit the information and get some aspects out of it to get a strategic advantage or you can get some information rent and hence you might be reluctant to give it up and pass it on to others. But uh, literally speaking, if you have an information and you know you can do something with that and that's benefiting you it as long as you know some other person is doing something is not competing with you it you can pass it on it's like an idea uh, you give an idea to somebody else and you can also make something with this idea so it's not ravenous but of course if you're in a space where you're both competing with each other then it is the case that this the implications of the information will change the nature of the competition and then it becomes a rival element comes into play as well. So it's a little bit, it's not black and white. So perhaps I was too simplistic in my opening remarks. Uh, so it gets a little bit more complicated. In particular, it might enhance uh, than the rivalness of existing competition. Uh, in this sense, it might uh, make things more complicated. Um, let me perhaps say one final word to uh, the what um, uh, Professor Bai said. Um, the sense is that you know data allows one to act much more fast in a much more timely manner, uh, and I see that uh, as a big advantage as well. So, in particular, if you want to deal with crisis, you can act more fast. But of course, the crisis will also be much faster. So, if you think of financial crisis, so everything is much faster. So everything is sped up. So, on the one hand, the government can respond faster. On the other hand, many of the financial instabilities are much faster as well. So, it's a little bit of a horse race between the two you know, which one will be more speedily than the other one. And of course, the more data the government has, the less privacy there is. That's another trade-off I want to consider. So let me- No, no, no that's great. Thank you, Martin. chung -in. Okay, uh, uh, I, I think uh, I will just add one point about the effect, uh, effect of the platforms on innovation. And Marcus has already explained some. And uh, one aspect I would like to, uh, to mention is that uh, some of these uh, uh, platforms, uh, they are uh, also uh, investors. Uh, they have a large internal in investment fund. When a new innovator uh, come up with something and uh, these large firms may invest in them. So this can be positive or negative because uh, um, 
it's a source of funding for uh, for new entrepreneurs. However, uh, for the new entrepreneur's idea to become a commercial success, they may be reliant on the platform for some important resources. And in those cases, and uh, then their, uh, they, they, their incentive for innovation is weakened because they are, uh, when, even if they become a success, they, uh, they, they, they rely on the platform. So the platform can extract some rent there. So that's a worry uh, of uh, some of the uh, uh, innovators. Uh, they, they, they felt that, that they are just too reliant on the platform. Thank you very much. Uh, before turning to some of our other speakers, we got over the Q&A from Anjali about uh, a related question. A couple of speakers mentioned companies making algorithms public or sharing source codes. TikTok, for example, openly sharing their algorithm is unthinkable, says Anjali. It's their entire business model. Short of extremely stringent aggressive laws that would shut down a company and probably lead to many complicated legal battles, why would a private company do this? What incentive do these tech giants have to freely share their bread and butter? I don't know if Karan or, or chong -An or Martin or anybody wants to comment on this, but it was, I, I agree with Anjali that the talk of sharing algorithms sounded funny. Maybe we misunderstood what the speakers meant, but if someone could address this, please. And let me uh, get a pitch in here. Um, uh, yes, uh, in some cases, uh, sharing the code uh, just uh, uh, just give away all your commercial secrets. In some other cases, um, it may not, may not be that uh, that uh, bad a problem. For example, uh, Huawei, when they try to get into the European markets. Uh, the, those governments have very important concerns about uh, whether it's secure to use them. So in the case of Huawei, they gave their uh, source code to the regulators and uh, asked them to, to check uh, whether there are backdoors or etc. So that, uh, of course, uh, in, in that case, for many reasons, it doesn't uh, succeed in convincing uh, the European governments uh, about uh, the security of their product. Uh, however, that's something they tried. Uh, I think um, uh, in other circumstances, uh, that kind of measure can help to convince uh, other governments uh, about uh, how, uh, uh, how risk can be controlled. Can I Thank you very I much, John. Oh. Yeah, Marcus. So sometimes, you know, you, these algorithms are also a little bit of a black box because they're so complicated, you don't really see what all is going on. So one way to hide your algorithm is just to make it so complicated and uh, such that it's very hard to figure out what really is going on. It's like the legal strategy used to be, you want to do discovery, here's 2 billion documents, do discovery. Of course, search engines changed that, but it was a strategy. Um, let me try to turn this a little differently since we are thinking internationally and globally. Um, so one of the striking questions for me is about who do you trust where you as your average citizen? Um, so I remember on one of our first trips to Beijing several years ago, there was this sense of Americans coming in and saying, you know, why do you trust all these, the, the government and all these companies with so much data? And then the Chinese and others would point out to the Americans, but you, you, you allow all these back doors for the FBI and for, for all kinds of government agencies in the US. Um, and it turned out that there was a, a divide, a sort of cultural divide in, uh, in trust, and I'm reminded of my own field, which is monetary policy in some ways, and how, you know, it, when, when central banks were doing QE, quantitative easing, in, in Europe, the trusted thing was to do loans, discount loans to banks and all kinds of private sector assets, but God forbid that the central bank should do too much for governments 
uh, too much for the Greek government or the Italian government. And in the US, it was the mirror image. Um, you can do as much as you want for the government, but God forbid that you should do quantitative easing on private sector. I mean, these things change over time, but I guess I, I, I'd like to ask some of our panelists to talk about as they face bringing together standards, all the things we talked about, how, how do you see perceptions as differing across countries or across regions? And is this something you, we, you think we can get beyond? Maybe Karan, Elena, Martin, you can talk about this, Karan? Uh, Adam, I'm happy to. And if I could just very quickly though, back on the algorithms point. Um, Please maybe, do. Maybe just, just, just two thoughts here. I mean, I think one, uh, well, maybe three points. First of all, we actually come from, a, as a company, a pretty open source kind of uh, environment. Android, et cetera, is all fairly, fairly open source. So it is, it, I think there are some algorithms that are, in fact, sort of uh, uh, publicly available. But, but in general, um, I think the question, yeah, to some extent, this is an intellectual property question, but it is also very much a security question, right? I mean... The reality is that often those who are pushing for opening up the algorithms are those who would be quite happy to utilize it, not necessarily, you know, for national security threats, although that's also up there, but simply to get a better understanding of how to evade the enormous protections we build to prevent spam, to prevent theft, to prevent all of these other things that we don't want to see have online. And, and so I do think that as we talk about algorithmic transparency, we really need to ask, why are we doing it? Um, to the extent that what we're trying to get at is competition issues, I would suggest that there may be better ways to do that. To the extent what we're trying to get at, um, on the other hand, is sort of a consumer protection kind of approach, I think the more thoughtful way to get at it may be to, by ensuring that what we say an algorithm does, and in fact does, so, so having you know, testing, input, output kinds of, 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 of sort of um, metrics that go along with it. So in any event, I just sort of put down a quick marker back on algorithms uh, we may want to come back to. I mean, on your question about, about trust and around whether we see different things in different places around the world, Adam, different approaches, I think the answer is both yes and no, right? I do think that there is a fundamental questioning that you know exists to some extent everywhere around the world about the role that technology is playing in our lives and and um, people you know at varying uh, varying ways feel uncomfortable about that in some sense and i can tell you from the perspective of a big technology company we care about that enormously because it you know at the end of the day if you lose the trust of consumers you do it is fundamentally, you know, uh, a threat to your to your to your business proposition. Now, at Google, I'm very happy to say we, you know, poll after poll shows that we continue to be enormously trusted by people to actually provide what they are looking for, and 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 we are, we but we take that we take that responsibility and that charge very much to heart, and that is one of the reasons why we you know, are, are invest the amount of time and resources and effort in making sure we remain at the cutting edge of providing uh, services that users ultimately, ultimately want. A slightly different variation on your question, though, is, is, is around um, the different approaches we see governments taking in different places around the world. And this gets back a little bit to the approach that, that, to the, the answer I gave before. I do think that we are seeing some places around the world where governments fundamentally look at technology and not just big tech, technology as I described as it spreads across and see it as, yes, this is ultimately going to be an enabler for growth. It's going to be an enabler for equity, uh, greater uh, income equality, uh, the enrichment of our people and lives, and how do we, we, we ultimately work to strengthen that? And particularly coming to the pandemic, you know, how to build back better, smarter technologically. I think we do see other places around the world where there is a much more inward looking approach, much more skepticism, much more autarkic approach to technology um, and, and see it largely through a political lens uh, or a geopolitical lens. And that is, that is fundamentally concerning. And I think you're going to see ultimately innovation 
migrate more to the countries that have the more progressive sort of leaning into innovation kind of view. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I'm glad you picked up on the algorithm point as well. Um, and Lena or Martin, anything you would like to bring up on this topic of how different perceptions of who to trust, just government versus private sector, play out across countries or regions? And when you go first, because I saw you on mute, so go ahead, I'll follow up. Okay, you. sure. Um, so yeah, I, there's a there's a lot of variation both in in, in what who people trust and who they're allowed to trust with data. So the way I think about it is in the US, a lot of it is mistrust of the government, but uh, uh, people tend to be more willing to share their data with private companies. And then in China and the EU, there seems to be less concern about government surveillance of their government, but then more concern about private companies. And I think Henry Gao has, has come with an interesting theory here that the EU is all about the sovereignty of the individual the U.S. is all about the sovereignty of the firm, you know, benefiting U.S. firms. And then in China, it's really all about the state. And I think that that's one of the reasons that we have so many divergences and difficulties in creating uh, systems that interoperate. But from the, the average citizen level, one of the interesting things has been watching China's citizens and their view on privacy um, develop, where uh, they've, they've always said that they have no control over government surveillance of their activities. But now they're finally able to have some control over what the private firms uh, are able to gather on them and in some ways actually have more ability to uh, to control that than than in the us and i think that's just because they've been barraged with so many frauds and their data has been leaked so many times that they're uh, that they're much more aware of the risks of giving their data to every random company whereas in america we often just hand out our credit card information and our social security numbers um, pretty pretty quickly, so uh, it it is really fascinating to watch watch these these divergences, and, and we'll see how it plays out in in uh, attempts to interoperate. After Alina Chung in, if you feel Martin mischaracterized China, you should put in what you think is a correction. But Alina, please. Yeah, just to piggyback on what Martin said, um, many different ways to pass this in cybersecurity. The mantra used to be trust but verify. And now there are models of uh, zero trust in, in systems. And so I think striking that balance at the state level as well as the individual level is tricky, especially for countries in Southeast Asia that feel increasingly pressured by this geopolitical, geotechnological rivalry between the US and China. A lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the platforms, a lot of the software in Southeast Asia is a mishmash of everything and everywhere. And part of that is deliberate. Part of that, of course, is cost-driven. Uh, but it's this desire to enmesh as many players as possible into the region to try to avoid just the circumstance that we're increasingly finding ourselves in. And so it's a little unfortunate um, that the idea of trust has now emerged um, and evolved into one of whether to trust or not, because this interdependence that we thought technology was going to offer can either become a situation of dependence um, or slightly more unlikely, independence. Um, sorry, I meant to say interdependence between, between players um, in Southeast Asia. You have countries like Vietnam that are trying to go their own way with 5G, uh, countries like India as well. They don't know that that will turn out to be a huge success at scale because the capital investment is so high. But um, at the individual level, I, mean, I agree with Martin, so many of us are so willing to trust uh, companies, even governments in certain countries with our personal information because we're unaware of some of these risks and dangers that come along with volunteering that information. Thank you. Um, yes, let, let, let me uh, just uh, uh, just uh, uh, follow up on, uh, um, on Martin's uh, points. Uh, I think uh, yes, uh, Chinese regulators are um, uh, take, uh, taking care of uh, uh, privacy protection of individuals uh, uh, more now, not only uh, from uh, from private from businesses. 
but also the uh, Personal Information Protection Act also uh, imposes uh, restrictions on government collection of data and use of uh, individual data. So uh, I, th this is, uh, I think the learning curve is still steep. This is uh, the early stage. So the regulators are still uh, learning how to do it well to balance all the considerations. Um, uh, so the, I, I think countries uh, should uh, share more about their experience so that uh, the whole world can come up with better solutions. Thank you very much, Zhang. And that's the perfect entree for me to do a final lightning round. I'm going to ask each member of the panel going the reverse order from before. So Alina, Mark, and so on. What would, as we're talking about countries converging, if there was a policy measure or an agreement or an understanding you would like to see happen, tell us what it is. What is it you would like to see on the international agenda? And bonus points, since there isn't a world trade, a world information technology, a WITO <laughs> uh, organization yet, what do you think is the appropriate international venue? And it's okay to say, you know, bilateral deal or whatever. But so what would you want to have happen and who, what organization or what group of countries or would you want to make it happen? So Alina, please. You know, there are some really interesting and substantive discussions going on at the UN, particularly on norms and, and rules of the road, state behavior and cyberspace. And they involve the private sector as well. What I would like to see within the UN setting is a more inter-regional discussions taking place, particularly among Global South countries, because there's a lot to learn among ourselves. Uh, we often absorb knowledge from the Global North, but we forget that we are rich in our own knowledge and cultures and can contribute to the discussion. And as I mentioned, reimagining tech. Thank you. Martin? I would say that uh, it would actually be a United States uh, unilateral measure, which is uh, a United States unified data privacy uh, protection regime that could operate on the same level as GDPR or China's new personal information protection law, because that could then be the basis for a sustainable private privacy shield or a sustainable uh, international agreement. But until I think the United States has that, it's all just going to be too fragmented and messy for people to really feel like they can interoperate with us and have that kind of uh, confidence. Uh, not that it's not going to be easy. Though. No, very provocative. Thank you, um, Karan. You know, Adam, it, and, and a number of these points have come up in the course of the conversation today. But there's just so many spaces where we see divergent regulation happening. So on content, online content on privacy, on, on the way markets are, are operating, you know, financial, fin fintech. I, I think, you know, all of these, any individual one of them is ripe for some degree of convergence uh, in terms of cross-border approaches and thinking. I, I would just hope that, that, you know, in doing so, two things, one, we have to recall and remember, we, are, we, are, we, have, we have sort of lost some sense of the appreciation for the value, the contributions that are being made to the world by the technological innovation that we've seen over the last 10, 15, 20 years. So some, some balance in approach, I think, is critical. Again, regulation, fine, we are going in that direction, but, but balance. And then secondly, look at the activity, the nature of the activity, not necessarily, you know, the, the, handful of largely American technology companies that frequently are, are targeted with these initiatives, I think were the two things that I would answer. And then in terms of how best to do it, multilateral fora with, with the, I guess the exception recently, the OECD tax agreement, I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of momentum there. So I'll join Martin in sort of urging unilateral leadership by the United States, I think in, in advocating for some of these notions as norms. Thanks. Um, Chung in. Um, I, I, I still think uh, a multilateral uh, for, uh, forum or fora or an organization uh, is important. Um, then there, uh, you need to balance two things. One is that uh, the uh, viewpoints, the perspectives uh, presented there 
are, are uh, representative of the diverse considerations of different, uh, different countries. But at the same time, we also need to make uh, the decision making uh, efficient. Uh, so so there, there, there may be some tension between these two considerations. However, I, I think uh, these two both are important. Uh, but the first one uh, to me is especially important. Thank you. And Marcus. So I broadly agree. I think essentially we have global firms, global networks. So we need a, a global uh, multilateral forum uh, to, to find some baseline regulation. And I think what's important is to distinguish between individual information and statistical information. So individual information should be given to the individual and it can be carrying it over from platform to platform, while statistical information uh, is belongs to the platform in a sense, but it should be in such a way to some extent only protected for a certain limited amount of time because then you can have innovation on this statistical information like we have in all traditional ways of collecting information in the past. And I think that's, that's uh, I don't have a particular, uh, um, that will be my guiding principle in a sense. Thank you very much. And thanks to all our panelists for tonight's discussion of economic policy making in a big data, big tech global economy. As I mentioned, this was the second panel of the inaugural Next Step Economic Conference, a joint effort of the Lee Kuan Yew School of the National University of Singapore and the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I think tonight's panel represented exactly what we want to achieve, which is practical discussions spanning around the Pacific, around the globe, uh, not based on economic analysis, but not limited to economic analysis and based on a combination of practical and thoughtful efforts. The Next Step Conference will take place for the first time in person in May 2022 in Singapore. It will be an annual event from then on. We're delighted to have the support of Tomasek and other leading Singaporean institutions along with the National University of Singapore in this effort, as well as an advisory panel chaired by Tharman, the senior minister from Singapore. I will just advertise that the, the, with this particular start of the Next Step Conference virtually coincides with and partners with our friends at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. We're about to begin their Golden Jubilee Conference. Um, the, closing session of our panels and the opening session of their conference is a dialogue with Martin Wolf, the chief economics commentator of the Financial Times on the broadest issue concerning us. Is it possible for humanity to cooperate in delivering global public goods? Uh, this will take place tonight, Singapore time, tomorrow morning, Washington time, uh, seven and seven. Um, broadcast live on this and other similar channels. Uh, it will be led off by introductory remarks by my friend Ravi Menon, the Managing Director of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and then moderated and dialogue with Martin Wolf, Danny Kwa, the Dean of the LKY School. So with thanks again to everyone with hope for the future for the small way for the Next Step Conference and in a big way for finding the next solutions to economic problems, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.